Welcome to our A to J Author 2017 training series. This is Jessica Frank, A to J Author Program Manager for the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. This video series contains four videos. You're currently watching video two. The four videos will cover how A to J Author and Hot Docs work together, an overview of A to J Author and a basic question de design, Video three will cover macros and functions, and video four will cover repeat loops, advanced logic, and tips and tricks from our more experienced authors. As I said, this is video two. We're first going to cover A to J Author, an overview of the software itself, including the different components that make up the authoring tool. And then we'll focus on basic question design, including how to create questions and some basic authoring tips. So to begin, here are our navigation tabs. This is the first screen that you will see once you are logged into the a2jauthor.org website and have launched the authoring software. This is the interviews tab. Along the left-hand side of the screen, you will see our navigation tabs. I'll, go, I'll start going through those now. This is a zoom in of our navigation tabs. The first tab is the About tab. The About tab is where you as the author place metadata about the interview itself and set certain variables that will dictate how the interview looks to the end user. Metadata includes information like the title of the interview, a description, the jurisdiction where this interview is being going to be used. You can choose the language. A to J Author currently supports 14 different languages. You can set the avatar's skin tone, so we have a uh, skin tone 1, 2, and 3. And you can also select the gender for the guide avatar. The end user selects their avatar's gender, but the skin tone that you select dictates, dictates for the entire interview. Under this section, you can also add, uh, la under layout, you can add information like your logo, your legal aid organization court logo. You can change the ending graphic. By default, it is a courthouse, but you can make it um, any logo that you'd like. You can allow the end user to provide feedback to you as the author and to us as the software developers by enabling feedback on the feedback tab. You can include revision history for future authors to know when this interview has been worked on. And you can add information about yourself as the author. All of this metadata will not be displayed to the end user. It's only information for um, other authors who have access to the authoring side of this interview. The title will be displayed to the end user and any graphics or logos that you attach would be displayed. The next tab down is the variables tab. This is where you'll either import your component file from HotDocs, that .cmp file, for those of you that have worked with HotDocs before, or you're going to make variables from scratch using the Add button at the top right-hand corner. This tab gives you a list of all the variables you have in your interview arranged alphabetically by um, the beginning of the name of the variable. It also tells you what type of variable it is, be it text, true, false, date, number, multiple choice. And it also tells you if the variable is uh, allowed to be used in a repeat loop, so if it can hold multiple values. By double clicking on any name named a variable in the list, it'll open up the variable design window and you'll be able to either edit the name of the variable, change its type, or make it uh, hold multiple values. You can also add notes about that variable on the variable design window. The next tab down is the steps tab. If you think about steps, uh, you think about them in an outline. They're the big headline chunks that you'd have in an outline. Um, you can have up to 13 steps in an interview. By default, an interview will come with four. You can edit the name of the variables and you can add and delete sorry, you can edit the name of the steps, the signs, and you can uh, add or delete steps from this tab as well. This is an example of how um, the signposts or the steps will look to your end user. The next page tab down is the pages tab. This is where you're going to spend a majority of your time and we'll go more in depth in the next section into how to work within the pages tab. 
but there's a lot going on on this tab. So first, you can see that you can open, clone, add, delete, um, or create new pages or pop-ups at the top. The pages are listed in order of step and then alphanumerically. The pages tell you, the list of pages tells you the name and the beginning part of the question of the text. And then over here on the right hand side, you, there are little icon hints about what fields are included in this page and if they are required or not. So for example, in this screenshot over on the right, far right hand side, this question two dash name has three text variables. The first and the last variable fields are required because they have these little red stars next to them. The second one down is the gender question and it has a gender variable also required. The other questions showing up in the list do not have any fields right now. They're purely text questions. And at the bottom here, we have the pop-ups, which are a list of all your pop-ups. I don't have any in this uh, screenshot example, so the list is blank, but if I did, there would be a list of my pop-ups as well. To edit any question, you simply double click on the name of the question and up will pop the question design editor. Same thing for pop-ups. The map tab is the next one down the list. The map tab is a way in which you can visually see how your interview is flowing. The pages tab only is listed alphanumerically, but this map tab lets you see the bigger picture, lets you see the forest for the trees, and allows you to uh, visually see the flow of your interview. It also gives you icon clues about what are in each uh, question, and it's color coordinated to match the steps. You know that um, tan, yellow, and purple here are all in different steps. A new addition to A to J Author 6 is the Files tab. The Files tab allows you to see all of the external files that are included in your A to J guided interview. So if you have logos, if you have images, pop, up, um, pop out learn mores that have a video or a graphic, um, if you have XML lists attached, for example, if you want to have a list of states, we have a pre-populated US states XML list, so you don't have to type it out in alphabetical order. You can, on this page, also see the guide.json and the guide.xml. Guide.xml is what runs within the authoring system. Guide.json is the what it plays in the A to J viewer to allow your end user to see your guided interview. From this page, or from this tab, you can also delete external files that you may have attached. If a file is allowed to be deleted, it will have a checkbox next to it. You can see, for example, here, guide.json and guide.xml do not have checkboxes because you cannot delete those. Those are um, intrinsic interview files. But the other files on the screenshot are able to be deleted. They're all things that I added to the interview itself. So I can check them and then click the delete checked files and it will delete them for any files that I've selected from my interview. I can also upload files at this point. So if I wanted to bulk upload images or um, XML files, I could do that quickly here. You can also attach those same files when you're authoring in the question design window when you're actually creating the question. So this is just two places that you can add files to your guided interview file. The next tab down is the All Logic tab. This also is an addition to A to J Author 6. This allows you to see all the logic that is running in your interview and it only shows you the questions that have logic in them. So you're not gonna see every question in your interview, just the ones with logic. You'll see whether it's before or after the question. We'll talk about that in the advanced logic section, what that means, but it either runs before your question is displayed or it runs after the end user has made some selection in the question. This screenshot here only shows after because I don't have any um, before in my interview but here you can see the logic and you can edit it here. So if you are converting old A to J4 interviews into A to J6, this is one of the first stops you should make to ensure that your logic properly converted. If there are errors with your logic, these boxes will be red and there will be an error message indicating what is wrong with your interview logic. The All Text tab is another new addition to A to J Author 6. 
This allows you to see just the text of your interview. This is particularly helpful if for some reason you find out while testing that you have spelled judgment wrong throughout your entire interview or petitioner, something um, like that that you need to make bulk changes to. You can do a control F to find all of those places and make the changes quickly by editing right here in the fields. Or you can do a find and replace um, if your browser allows for that and quickly make those changes as well. Preview mode is the next tab down. Preview mode allows you to see your guided interview the same way that your end user would see it. Preview mode here, I have the variables and script window open. When I test, I always have the this variables and script window open so that I can see that my vari variables are being populated correctly with the expected behavior. And I have the script open so that I can see what's going on behind the scenes and see that my conditions are running as expected. You open the variables and script window by clicking the orange button at the bottom labeled variables slash script. You can also close it by clicking that same button. You can use fill, which we'll talk about when we talk about question design. Fill is a way that you can, as, as you're creating the questions, add in sample values to then be used during testing so you don't have to type in the same uh, test answers over and over again. And resume edit takes you back into the point in which you were um, editing, you entered preview mode from. So if you started on question one, and you entered into preview mode and then you worked three questions down, resume edit will take you back to question one. If you click edit this, it would take you to that fourth question you were on at the point in which you wanted to leave preview mode. Then we have the report tab. The report tab is a great uh, tool for you to use when you basically finished your guided interview and you need to have it peer reviewed. So the full report will generate a report of all text, variable, all conditions that are used inside of a guided interview. The transcript report is just a script of the text. So if I was having this peer reviewed by someone who might not be familiar with the software, so I don't necessarily need them to click through the interview, I just want them to read it like my subject matter expert, I would generate a full report and have them read from there and make any suggestions and changes. If I was having this translated into another language, I would use the transcript report because the translator doesn't need to see all the conditions and everything underneath the interview. They just need to translate the forward facing text for the end user. This is an example of a full report. This is the very beginning. You can see it has the metadata about the, in, um, the guided interview, the jurisdiction, and it has uh, the steps that are used. This is, if I had scrolled down on that same interview, this is showing close up what um, is, would be displayed to you when you generate a full report. And this is an example of an audio transcript for that same interview. So the full report was several pages long. The audio transcript is this one little paragraph length um, that just shows the text that needs to be translated. The final tab, that we'll talk about today is the Publish tab. The Publish tab allows you to do a couple of things. First, you can download your zipped A to J file. This is what you're gonna want to download if you are sharing it with uh, someone who's gonna be peer reviewing it in their own A to J author.org account. It includes your guided interview, that guide.xml, the guide.json file, and all those external files that you may have attached to your interview. If you select just the download.a to j file, it's going to just download your guide.json and guide.xml files. It's not going to include any of those external files. You can also on this tab publish to LHI's Rebuild QA, their staging server, or you can publish to LHI's production server from these buttons. You're going to want it to test on the Rebuild QA server and then publish to production when you're ready to go with your final A to J guided interview. Once you're on the LHI servers, you can attach or connect your hot docs template to your A to J guided interview. Now we're gonna talk about question design. This is where 95% of the work that you do in A to J author will happen. The first step is of course to log in. 
go to our website, adajauthor.org, click the Author tab. If you are already logged in, you'll see a button that says Run A to J Author. If you have not yet logged in, you'll be prompted to do so from that page. Once you are in the authoring tool, you either open up a blank interview or you can work on one that you've already started or one that you are editing or revising. From that point, where you're going to spend most of your time is on the Pages tab. And we'll talk a little bit about the Pages tab, and then we'll dive deeper into the Question Design Editor, which is where you actually make changes to pages and add new questions. So here, the first step that you can see is you can add new pages. If you double click on any of the pages listed, you will be taken to the Question Design Editor. Questions appear in an A to J guide interview by how they're connected to each other. If you want to see that, you look at the Map tab. Questions here are listed by step and in alphanumeric order. By clicking on any of the questions, it'll pop up that questions design, uh, the question design editor. You need to double click to open it. Once it's open, we'll talk a little bit here about what the different sections look like. But this is an example of what it looks like when you first open the question design editor. The whole flow with A to J Author 6 in the question design editor is to keep scrolling down that editor to get additional ac uh, access to additional features within the authoring tool. So at the beginning, we have the page info section. This lists the step that your question is currently assigned to, and it's where you can change it the name of the question, also editable, and any notes. These notes are for the author's eyes only. They will only be seen by you and whoever has a copy of the author version of your interview. They will not be seen by the end user that will ultimately be using the guided interview. If we go down to the next section, the question text section, this is where you will type in the body of your page. When you click into the text section here, for example, if you clicked into the space where it says, what is your address, you would get a text editor, which I'll show you in a second, that will allow you to embolden, italicize, underline, indent, outdent, and add hyperlinks or pop-ups. You can also add text audio, which would be audio that plays when the question is displayed to the end user. And there's, at the very bottom of the screenshot, is the learn more prompt. The learn more prompt is what the end user avatar thinks. This is the question your end user has that your guide avatar can reply to. Here are the formatting options that I talked about. When you clicked into the text section, any text section, you'll get these uh, a formatting options. So embolden, indent, or italicize, indent, outdent, um, and add a hyperlink and a pop-up. If you kept scrolling, you'll see here in the screenshot that the Learn More prompt is visible. Then there is the Help Style. That is the answer that the guide avatar can give. And that can either be just plain text, show me graphic, or show me video. You can, if you select show me graphic or show me video, an upload button similar to the two blue upload buttons you see here on the screen will appear and you'll be able to select a file from your local hard drive. Under the help style is the help itself. This is the answer that the guide avatar gives to the end user if they click learn more. So this would be the reply to uh, what if I don't know my zip code? The reply would be you can look at the help would be you can look it up on the USPS website and here's a link to the, the website or um, how do I know how many dependents I have and then a, a paragraph text explaining how someone determines how many dependents they have and finally on this screen it's showing the audio there's two upload buttons you can have audio um, mp3 recordings for the text of the question and for the help answer itself if you kept scrolling, you get to the fields section. The fields are a, a way for you to get information out of your end user. These are things that they're going to have to type in to tell you or make selections from. On this screen, you can, um, by default, a question has no fields, so you have to add a field. When you add a field, these additional um, sections become available including um, adding and deleting fields with the plus and minus button, changing the field type. That is the way that the end user's answer 
is uh, the way the field, the question is formatted for them. The field label is what is in front of the field itself. It um, is often things like if you have a question, what is your name? The field label in front of the first field would be first, then middle, then last. It helps give context to what specifically that box in front of the end user is asking for. You can assign a variable to that field to collect and hold the information the end user types in. You can include a default value, which will show to the end user as a suggestion. For example, if you are in Florida, you can have a list of states, like what is your address? The list of states would show all 50 states, but you could have a default value of Florida that would display to them and would be collected unless they changed, the end user changed it. You can require an end user to fill, to answer a question. You can limit the number of characters that can be uh, typed in. A new feature in A to J6, when you as the author limit the characters, when you put in a max character count, the end user is given a countdown um, that then goes into the negative if they exceed the count and they are prevented from moving on if they have exceeded the count that you have placed on them, the limit. And finally on this screenshot, it says if invalid say, by default, if a question is required, there is a default prompt uh, that appears if the end user does not answer that question. It says something to the effect like you need to fill in this answer or you need to answer this question, um, but you as the author can change what that says um, if you'd like. Digging a little deeper into the field section. So here, but for example, with the default value, I have uh, included a screenshot right here that shows um, that I have Cook as my default for a question about county. You can, on dates, limit the range of values that are shown to the end user. If you only want them to be able to put in dates in the future, you can have the minimum value be today, or you can type in the year 2017. And it will not, A to J author will not allow the end user to select a date that is in the past. Um, same for if you only want them to select dates in the past and you don't want them to be able to select future dates, you can put the max value of today, the word today all in caps. That's called a function and we'll talk about those functions in uh, video three. Um, you, like I mentioned, can set max character counts. If you watch the little GIF over here on the far right above our A to J logo, you can watch as I type it in how the character limit is decreasing, if I keep typing, it shows that it turns red, goes into the negative, and explains that it has exceeded the character count. Then finally, you can use internal and external lists to give your end users options to select from. A lot of people use the, the external list us underscore states.xml that we have on our um, on our website to use because it's already in alphabetical order and the answer appears using the two-letter postal code. Um, so if they select Alabama, it the answer is formatted to come out as AL. You can also type in an internal list. So if you have something that is shorter or a list of counties, you can type those in manually yourself. There are 14 field types that allow you to pick how, the, how to format the field and show it to your end user. So here, for example, number dollar will include a dollar sign in front of the field label. Social security and phone number, well, phone number will show a uh, grayed out um, suggestion to put a phone number in 334. Social security, will the SSN will show the grade 323 or 324 to suggest the format to the end user. Date will display a calendar. Um, radio buttons and check boxes um, allow you to uh, display the types to the end user in a little bit different way. So there's 14 different options in A to J out there on how you can format the field for your end user. If we continue to scroll down, we get to the button section. By default, there's one button on every brand new question. It's the continue button because the end user has to have some way to move from one question to the next. Here on the buttons, again, you can have a label on your button. It's what displays to your end user. You can assign a value, a variable to that button that um, when the end user selects it, 
the variable will be assigned whatever you put in the default value. The destination is the next question in the line for your end user. On button section, you also indicate whether this is part of a repeat loop and what to do with it, which we'll talk about in video four. So as I mentioned, by default, every button, every uh, question has one button, the continue button. And you can use buttons instead of fields for questions with three options or less. You can only have three buttons per page but you can label those buttons however you'd like. So for example, in the bottom left-hand corner, it says pick your favorite color from these three options. So I can have pink and lots of text, blue and lots of text, and yellow and lots of text. Um, so I can have it say whatever I want. And this is a great way to, um, if you only need basically a yes or no answer or uh, select one of three options, this is a great way to display it to your end user instead of using check boxes or radio buttons or making them type something in with like a text field. So what can a button do? A button can assign a value to a variable, it can branch an end user to another question, or it can set or increment counting variables, which we'll talk about on the repeat loop section in video four. The destination options, when you click on the button next to the word destination, you can select from a menu of the other questions you've already created special A to J commands like back to prior question, success process form, and different exiting functions that we will talk about in uh, video three, different exiting options that you have built into A to J author. Here's an example when you click that uh, button, the destination in the button section, this is the menu that pops up. So you can see that you can just select from one of the questions that you've already created. If you kept scrolling down, it would give you the special um, exiting buttons, exiting options, and the special A to J commands, like back to prior page. Finally, the last section when you scroll down to the end of the question design editor is the advanced logic section. We'll talk a little bit about advanced logic here, but as it indicates, it's advanced. So it's a topic we'll cover in the two, uh, in the last uh, video in the series, video four. Um, but just a quick overview. You can have logic run either before a question is displayed to the end user or after the end user has pushed one of your buttons that you have on the page. And it's simple open text box here where you script if else conditional statements. Basic logic syntax is there are five commands that you use in A to J author. If, else, go to, set, and end if. All if statements must have an end if at the end, just as every sentence must have a capital and a punctuation at the end, so too must a logic statement. The if indicates that you have started a command and the end if indicates to A to J author that you have finished a command. Each logic statement, each one of these five commands must be on their own line. They can, the if, else, go to, set, and end if cannot just be in one long line. So after every command, so if user gender equals female, hard return, or hit the enter key, and then whatever, go to or set of a value, hard return, or enter key, end if. That lets A to J know that each one of these commands is on its own line and that you have finished the logic statement. But again, we'll talk more about advanced logic in video four of this series. You can see all of the logic in your interview by quickly going to the All Logic tab. It displays every uh, question in your interview that has advanced logic in it. It's also editable right here. You don't have to go back into the question design editor. If you find out that you have spelled true wrong throughout your entire interview or judgment or plaintiff, something like that, you can quickly make changes here to all of the logic sections. And it only displays the sections that have active logic in them. The final issue to talk about in this video is overall design of questions. Some of these tips and tricks are from our advanced authors who have given me these, this feedback over time. So the first issue to deal with is keeping your audience and your goal in mind. You always want to include instructions on how to complete the forms. 
if the form requires somebody to have their W-2, the address of their spouse's business, or anything like that, information they wouldn't readily have available to them um, at any given point, let them know that up front so that they can either um, have that information and get it, gather it, or end the interview and come back to it when they have that information readily available. You can always group questions. The form itself does not dictate the order in which the questions have to be presented to the end user. If there are questions about their spouse on page one of the form and page four and page seven, you can group all of the questions about their spouse in one section and one step, making it easier for the end user. You always want to give context to each set of questions, allowing you to transition smoothly from one topic to the next. Just like when you're writing a paper, you want to have transitions between paragraphs, you want to have transitions between steps. So for example, now I'm going to ask you questions about your spouse. When you get to the end, we finish the questions about your spouse, now we're going to talk about your children. That just allows the end user to know where in the flow of the interview they are and gives them some contextual basis on which uh, the next set of questions is going to come. You always want to begin with easy and safe questions. We don't recommend jumping in on question one with what is your social security number or why are you late on child support. Start off with easy questions, build trust in the interview, and then you can ask those more difficult questions. The goal is a fifth grade reading level. You want to use bold, but you should use it sparingly. And there are 14 different ways that you can ask questions of an end user in A to J using fields plus the buttons. So you want to keep it interesting by using different question formats to ask the questions, but you don't need to use all 14 of them in one interview. Um, and you don't need to use all 14 of them in a row. Um, so you can balance interesting question formats with some consistency. And we recommend using images in the learn more section or videos to help your end user out because a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, and so if there is something like you need to sign at the end of your petition before you leave, or you need to get this section notarized, take a picture of the form itself, circle it in red using um, any kind of quick editor like paint on your computer and upload that image so that the end user gets a visual of what they need to do. The order of the questions is important. At the beginning of that interview you should have that checklist and instructions, so a checklist of things they're going to need to answer the questions and instructions on how to use the interview. You should also have um, get those qualification and eligibility questions out of the way. You don't want someone to spend 30 minutes filling out a form just to find out that they don't qualify because they're in the wrong county or they make too much money. Whatever those qualifying questions are, get them out in the beginning so that you can branch people who are not appropriate for the form out as quickly as possible. We meant, I mentioned the sensitive questions starting off easy. You can start off with neutral questions and get harder and you can embed questions in a safe context. So if the form does require their social security number, you can explain why you're asking for it, or you can explain why you're asking for their gender or their address, anything that people might be uncomfortable typing into a computer system. And it's also an opportunity for advocacy. There's a couple legal aid organizations that I know about that no longer ask for social security numbers via an A to J guided interview because they don't think that it's proper to have somebody typing it in in case uh, they're on a public terminal or they're at the library and they forget to log off. So instead, even though the form requires it, they leave that piece of inter information off the interview and include a page at the end that says make sure to handwrite in your social security number. So it's an opportunity for advocacy as well. Finally, thinking about the individual questions themselves. And these are tips from an advanced author that I got. Um, you should seek to evoke the truth. You should ask for an answer on only one dimension. You should accommodate for all possible answers. Allow for an I don't know or an other. Um, there are things that you as the author may think that everybody knows offhand, but there are um, a lot of cases where an I don't know or an other or I'm, I'm not sure are appropriate responses as well and let them explain um, in a further text box. You should be careful about assuming what an, a user knows. 
questions shouldn't rely on previous questions and if they do you should use tips uh, you should use things that are built into A to J already called macros which we'll talk about in video 3 to recall information that they've already given you so you, if you have to ask a series of questions for example about their children and um, you need information one child at a time and there's a series of questions that they need to fill out remind the end user which child they're talking about. So what is the name of your first child? It's Bobby. The next question, say what is Bobby's date of birth? What is Bobby's, who is Bobby's father? What is Bobby's address? This reminds your end user of what they've said before. Be careful not to use leading language and always avoid questions that ask users to rank items by importance because items, uh, that's very subjective. The final thing to talk about is plain language and readability. You as the author are the subject matter expert on your the person, who, your end user, the person who's going to be using your form. Or if you're a developer, you're working with that subject matter expert. So make sure to write for your audience. Consider their age, their education, their culture, and the language of your reader. Make sure to use familiar words and phrasing. And if you have to use specialized terms, make sure you explain them. A to J author has a lot of just-in-time learning features that allow you to explain things to your end users at the point in which they need to know it. So if you have to use specialized terms, make sure to define them with a pop-up just to ensure that any end user that doesn't know what that word means has access to the definition. Make sure to avoid foreign, archaic, or noun-heavy phrasing. Use the active voice and direct address. Eliminate surplus words and omit the unnecessary details. You want to boil it down for your user and make it as easy as possible for them to complete the form. Generally, people using a guided interview are in a stressful situation. They're in a court setting or they have to go to court. They have something they have to deal with. Um, this is not a familiar area for them. And even experienced attorneys can be nervous uh, trying to fill out court forms properly. So you want to make it as easy as possible for your end user. Again, fifth grade reading level is the level that we recommend shooting for. There are tools on the report tab when you run a full report that will give you your grade ranking for your entire interview and question by question. So when you run a full report, it will be green if it's under a seventh grade reading level, it will be yellow if it's between seventh and ninth grade, and it'll be red if it's over ninth grade. And at the very end, you'll get your flush Kincaid score that ranks your, that grades your entire interview based on reading level. A great tip is to check, check out writeclearly.org's plain language online course. They use A to J author's sister software, Cali Author, um, to create Cali lessons that help teach you how to do, uh, how to handle plain language and how to address plain language in, in your writing. And here is the URL sites.google slash a slash lonnie.org slash plain dash language dash library slash home slash plain dash language dash online dash course. Thanks for watching. The next video in this series can be found on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash a to j author. And as always, if you have questions, feel free to email me at jessica at cali.org. Thank you.